Well, welcome to the 18th episode of Ideas and Lives. This is our second year. So it's our third episode in year two. And uh, we have Tzvi Bodhi, my colleague. Tzvi, introduce yourself. Hello there. Uh, I, uh, one thing Joe doesn't know that we have in common is I taught at Boston University for many years. In fact, I was teaching there, I think, when Joe went to the School of Communications. Well, Joe, we're, we're happy to interview today Joe Nocera, noted uh, New York Times columnist, Bloomberg columnist, uh, author of a number of books, and uh, generally an uh, interesting guy to, who has uh, interesting opinions. Joe, thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm looking forward to an interesting conversation. Great, great. So Joe, uh, this series is about ideas and lives and we do start out with the lives part <laughs> and okay. uh, how you grew up and uh, where you grew up and how that, um, we'll see how that uh, might've influenced your career. Huh. <laughs> uh, I grew up, I was the oldest of nine kids, um, and I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. And my family, uh, on my father's side, owned a grocery store and a liquor store that had been started by, by their father, who had immigrated from Italy and had met his wife, who had also immigrated from Italy, and they'd come to Providence. and. By the time, uh, so, you know, I, I, as a kid, worked in the store, and um, my father was the one person in his family who was not full-time with Nocera's Market or liquor store, and he was, a, he was a high school teacher. He was a high school math teacher. My mother, uh, after she had her nine kids in 12 years, decided that uh, she wanted to go to college herself. She hadn't been before. And so uh, she went to college full-time days. Uh, we went to Rhode Island College, which is right up the street from us. And then she became a teacher as well, uh, teaching um, mostly social studies, history, um, a little bit of French. Um, now, as the oldest child, were you helping to take care of the younger ones? No. I was a terrible oldest brother. I had <laughs> one goal. I had one goal, and my one goal was to get the hell out of Providence as fast as I could. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I was very dedicated to that goal. Um, and so I was not, my, my it, it's a, we're an interesting, I mean, we're not really, a, it's very unusual to have brothers and sisters that are nine that close, that, um, yeah, close together. close together in age without a surprising less closeness between the brothers and sisters than you would think. It was, mm -hmm. it, was it was a very, uh, it, was very it was a very crowded, it was, you know, it was a small middle class house in Providence, you know, had a lot of room, you know, everybody's, you know, three or four kids in a bedroom. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, so when I when I went to, you know, once I went to Boston University, um, I came back for the summers for a while. And, and I also used to uh, drive into Providence to work at my family liquor store on Saturdays. I'd have a little spending money. But, um, you know, I, 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 I mean, how I changed my career, you know, people in Providence, Providence is not a risk-taking city. And Rhode Island is not a risk-taking state. And so, you know, my parents were classic liberal Democrats from Rhode Island, and they didn't really believe in capitalism. They would never say it like that, but they didn't really believe in capitalism. They were totally, they were, you know, both in the teachers union, um, which is, I suppose, okay. Um, I'm not anti-union, but I am anti-teachers union. Um, and, and um, you know, my mother's vision of what a good middle-class life would be is like, you know, go work for the post office. Mm -hmm. And I tell her I want to be, you know, I said I want to be a journalist. She's like, well, that's, you know, uh, you know, that's a dying profession. <laughs> that's a dying <laughs> profession. 
Uh, and so, you know, I, I, um, I basically made my way eventually to Washington and eventually got a job at the uh, capital, something called Capital Hill News Service, which was a Ralph Nader funded Washington news service for small newspapers that couldn't afford a bureau. It was an interesting experience. Um, and uh, uh, from there, I went for the Washington Monthly. And but that's when let's, I, let's go back to college. Uh, you, uh, why? Tell, tell us a little well, bit. Well, I'm, I'm particularly interested in how you would summarize your BU School of Communications education. Um, and I don't mean this to insult BU, but if I had to do it over again, I certainly would have majored in a subject and not in journalism. Uh, you know, the mechanics of journalism you really do learn on the job. Um, and I don't, you know, or you can work on a school paper, which I also did. But, you know, I met some interesting teachers, but I, there's not a lot from that curriculum that sticks with me to this day. And, uh, and I think expertise in a sub in subject matter is more important than, than learning how to, you know, keep somebody on the telephone for an extra 15 minutes. That's interesting because I had uh, I was in the school of management teaching finance and I had a fair number of school of communication students who took finance. Well, they were smart. I wish I'd done that. I mean, my dirty little secret is I've been a business writer my whole life and, um, you know, I still can't decipher the numbers in an annual report. <laughs> that's okay because they're all fake numbers so. yeah. well that's what my colleague bethany mclean at fortune figured out when she was doing the enron story so yep yep <laughs> so we'll you get you, we'll get to enron later i have yeah some. so you you got into uh journalism uh very quickly in a way uh after college then right right i yes i um very quickly. Yeah, relatively quickly, relatively quickly. I mean, I started as a sec I started as a secretary at Capital Home News Service because uh, the guy who ran it uh, had polio and uh, he did not have the use of one of his arms. Um, and so he needed somebody to type up everything for him and do all the stuff for him that he couldn't do for himself. Uh, so I started as a secretary and then uh, he quit one day and made me the bureau chief, which was a terrible, terrible idea. I was 24. I had no idea what I was doing, but he was desperate to get out, I guess. So, and then I switched jobs with one of the journalists. So I made him the bureau chief and I became a reporter. And that's where I sort of really started to learn my, my craft. And then getting hired by Charlie Peters at the Washington Monthly was a really uh, big deal. Um, the pay was crap, but, but Charlie, is a great mentor and, and I don't know if he's mentored yes. many, many, many terrific journalists. And I feel honored to be in that number. And Charlie at 95, I saw him not that long ago. He's, uh, uh, he doesn't get around very well, but you know, he's still ready to talk about anything, including the uh, sad state of the Washington football team. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, he, is he still uh playing a role in the Washington Monthly? No, 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 no. Uh, it's been run for the last 20 years by a guy named Paul Glastris. Yeah, who was one of his. Who was one of his protégés and, and who's really putting out a terrific magazine. Did you yeah. have any contact with Ralph Nader when you were there? Oh, yeah. Ralph almost sued me. Why is that? Because I finally realized that Capital News was, was it was a hopeless enterprise and that uh, it was never gonna make any money. And I was tired of going back to him again and again and again and asking him for more money, small amounts of money to keep us going. And he would get upset. And, and uh, so I just, I sold it. He, he um, for some reason, took himself off the board. I can't remember why, but once he was off the board, I realized that I could sell it without him objecting. And so I did. Um, I basically sold it for the furniture. And all the reporters, I had left by then. I was at the Washington Monthly, but I was still the chairman of the board. And um, 
anyway, the new state's new service bought it and they integrated all, all of the uh, capital from new service reporters. So everybody still had a job and they were still basically doing the same thing. State's new service did more or less the same thing. And, um, uh, and anyway, Ralph was so mad, he was, he was going to sue me, but uh, somebody talked about a couple of people talked about it. Did you have any contact with him after that? Uh, occasionally, not often. Nothing, it was no, you know, I, I used to see him once in a while at a conference or something. Or, but no, I didn't have any, any personal contact with him. So now you're at, uh, at the Washington Monthly and you're covering particular interesting no, issue. No, it doesn't work that way at the monthly. Uh, back then, the monthly would always have two uh, editors along with Charlie. And they'd have a two-year stint. And every issue, you were expected to write one article and edit a, at least you know two others. Um, and I was worked in the first half of my stint, I worked with Nick Lemon. And the second half of my stint, I worked with Mickey Cows. And, um, and, and it, it had, you know, you, 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 were cover, you were writing about Washington, you were writing about bureaucracy. I, I actually wrote one of my very first stories about uh, the Redskins, believe it or not. Um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, and basically, yeah, I realized, I realized recently when I went back and looked at that story, because uh, they were doing an anniversary issue and they wanted you to. They wanted me to write about one of the stories I written about. I went back and looked at it, and I realized that Edward Bennett Williams, the um, original deal where Edward Bennett Williams bought the Redskins, was basically one of the very first private equity deals. Although nobody called it that, mm. where the debt got placed on the team, and uh, I mean, it just it, it, it totally uh, mirrored a private equity a private equity deal. So ultimately, the fans uh, basically bought the team for for uh, the owners. Mm. When he bought it from when he bought it from Jack Kent Cook. Mm. Interesting. Um, and then, well, from... that that let me just ask something about that. So it was the fans who became the owners of the team. No, 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 no. Just the debt was loaded onto the team. So that so and you know that so and the ticket prices started to go up. To pay okay. for it. Okay. Yeah. So then I, I went to, I, after that, I went to Paris for two years because my wife, my now my ex wife, my wife was, uh, uh, got into the diplomatic corps. And so she was assigned to the Paris embassy. So I went to Paris for a couple of years. And, uh, and from there, I went to Texas Monthly, where I spent three and a half years. And that's where I really became a business writer. Um, my very first story. Uh, which was assigned to me while I was still in France was about this guy named T Boone Pickens Jr. <laughs> and um, uh, the idea behind it, and it was Nick Lemon's idea. He had gone to Texas monthly ahead of me and was the executive editor. Um, the idea was that we wanted, they wanted to understand, this is pretty funny when you think about it. They wanted to understand why a Texas businessman was interested in doing business with those Yankees on the East Coast. <laughs> because uh, most Texas businessmen, you know, snubbed their nose at, especially oil men, especially the oil industry, uh, snubbed their nose at, 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 at the East Coast. And uh, Boone, you know, was sucking up to Wall Street analysts and, you know, doing, doing all kinds of uh, stock, um, not manipulation, but, you know, financial engineering kind of things. Um, Anyway, I, I, I started on this profile and about two months into it, I realized that uh, Boone was getting ready to do a deal, which he had a big, a big deal, uh, which um, uh, he had never done before. And um, basically the deal broke while I was working on the story and I wound up spending three weeks of my life in the Waldorf Astoria watching him try to take over uh, a company called City Service. And it was an incredibly exciting thing to watch happen. And uh, um, I wrote a, a prize winning story about it. And it was my first business story. And I was just totally captured by 
what I had seen and I thought, oh my God, this is what business is like. You know, I want, I want to, I want more of this. Uh, and not realizing that the opportunity that I had just had was incredibly rare. And uh, in fact, I do not believe anybody has ever before or since sat in the room as a journalist while one company tries to take over another. Are you, what did you become? Why did they let you in? Boone wanted recognition. Boone, Boone for, well, two reasons. The first is that I had worked on this story for a while before the deal went public and before anybody knew about it. So he and I had uh, created, um, if not a friendship exactly, um, a collaborative um, uh, uh, relationship. So it, he, uh, my being around the deal didn't bother him, although it did bother his aides a lot. And the second is, you know, he wanted to be a big shot and he wanted to sort of break past the, the business press and get into the general interest press. And, um, and he saw Texas Monthly as a way to do that. And he succeeded. You succeeded and he succeeded. Exactly. Uh, he came back to me a couple of years later and said, you know, I'm going to go after golf or I'm, I'm in the middle of a deal with trying to take over golf oil. Uh, you, you, let's do the same thing. Let's do it again. And I said, <laughs> no. I said, Boone, no. You know, when you're a magazine writer, you can only go to the well once <laughs> on a story like that. And uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll pass. Yeah. Was the golf one bigger? Oh yeah, Gulf Much Oil. Bigger. Yeah. Oh, huge. Yeah. yeah. He didn't get it. He didn't get it, but he walked away with a lot of money. Well, he became um, one of the most famous corporate raiders. That's right. He and Carl Icahn were the two who stood above all the others, really. Right. Right. And then uh, in in later life, uh, wind power. Right. Yeah, wind power. Um, he was also natural gas buses. He was really pushing this idea in the latter part of his life of natural gas, 18 wheeler, 18 wheeler natural gas trucks, which he believed would save a fortune, uh, both for the trucking industry and, and, uh, and for the country. And, you know, he was always being accused of, um, you know, talking his own book and which he perfectly, which he absolutely admitted. He was a total believer in natural gas. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean it was a bad idea. No, no. I think I was, the at, guy... so, uh, I was at his ranch once. He, he had a 68,000 acre ranch uh, up north of Amarillo in, a, in the Texas Panhandle. 68,000 acres. Think about that for a minute. Um, and it's big, so, bigger than the state of Rhode Island, probably. <laughs> as many as many as many Texans told me when I was in Texas, uh, where are you from, boy? Well, I'm from Rhode Island. We got ranches bigger than that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so you go to his ranch and, you know, most of it is just gorgeous. Just, just, you know, beautiful, you know, dove hunting and duck hunting and just three or four incredible houses. Uh, and then there's this little part of it that's hidden, that's kind of tucked away. And he's 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 drilling for fucking oil in his in his, in his, in his ranch. Oh, that's a right. And he had he had a full time. I mean, one of the people he employed, he had a full time geologist. Wow, interesting. Even towards the end of his life, even towards the end of his life, when he was, you know, we had a hard time. Um, he was like eighty nine, or I, I think the last time I was there, he was eighty nine. He died when he was ninety. He, uh, he, uh, he, he, he was hard for him to sustain more than a couple of sentences. And um, he forgot words all the time, of course, as we all do as we get older. And, uh, but then he, he, he was in his, using his walker, you know, he had his walker and he, he walked into his conference room. And on the conference room, there's this enormous map of his land and where the, where the oil wells were. And the, the geologist came in and she was giving me a little, you know, lecture about them. And suddenly, boom, he, he comes to life. He absolutely comes to life. Suddenly, he can speak in paragraphs because he's talking about geology. He's talking about his oil. He's talking about the stuff that he's talked about his whole life. 
it was really something. Interesting. Yep. So now you've you've made your name at Texas Monthly, and uh, where did you go next? Uh, where did I go next? Fortune. Well, Jane Amsterdam invited me to join the staff of Manhattan Inc., as it was then called. And I turned her down because I felt like I had to be loyal to Texas Monthly in Texas, which I liked a lot. Uh, Boone hired me to write an autobiography, but it didn't go well. And he fired me and I sued him. And um, uh, we settled. And uh, then I moved to New England. I moved to uh, Northampton, Massachusetts um, to go to work for uh, a guy named Dan Okrant, uh, a good friend of mine, the man, who, the man who founded Rotisserie Baseball, now known as Fantasy Sports. And uh, he was the editor of New England Monthly. It was this little, nice little magazine. Um, it really was a good magazine. I worked for him. I was there. I was his deputy for maybe a year or so. And then I uh, freelanced uh, for a little while. Uh, I wrote some stories for Esquire. And one of those stories became my first book called The Piece of the Action, um, which was about the process by which Americans went from being um, uh, savers to investors. And um, I built it around a series of characters like Charles Schwab, uh, D. Hawk at Visa, um, Ned Johnson at Fidelity, and it just told the story sort of chronologically, um, starting with the first credit, first uh, all-purpose credit card that Bank America did in 19, whenever the hell it was, 56 maybe, and uh, ends sort of uh, after the uh, crash of 87. You know that I uh, used to assign that book to my students. Yeah, I really you liked it. You didn't, I didn't really know. liked it. No, no, Thanks. I thought it was great. I thought it was, I was great. I was going to say, you obviously didn't have many students because uh, I had never exactly <laughs> sold. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't. You're right. Not enough to make it a... Uh, right. You know. it's a, it is a cult favorite, however. You know, it's, a, it's I, I look at back, I mean, I look back at that um, book and I, I, I'm kind of amazed at, at, at how I put that narrative together. Um, but on some level, that's always what I've done. I've taken gnarly subjects that don't naturally naturally connect to each other and and create the connective tissue so that it looks uh, like a um, it looks like a story that makes sense. And you explain complicated stuff in a way that uh, you know the non-specialist can understand. I, I'm a big fan of your books. Thanks. Uh, you're right. I do. That is what I do. I'm, I'm the great. My, my wife calls me the great explainer. Yeah, when, and, when she's not mad at me. That's that's what uh, Paul Salmon. That's how he defines himself as well. So yeah. you guys have. That makes sense to me. Yeah, he is. I mean, I, and and really, until I went to Fortune in the mid in the mid nineties. I mean, I I made my living writing about business for non-business publications, Esquire, GQ, uh, Newsweek for a year. Um, and, and, and that's really what I did. Yeah. The other guy who, you know, is in that same category, I think, is Michael Lewis. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Who's, who's had a great deal of success. <laughs> no, yeah, he has. He has. Well, yeah, he has. But yes. in terms of in terms of your, you said uh, you had trouble with balance sheets and so on. But then you started writing about these business issues. Um, that was also kind of learning on the job, economics and business. Yeah, for sure. But you know, I always thought um, I always thought that a great business story is like any great story. It's not. It, it, my friend Bethany McLean has a wonderful ability to see a story in numbers. And I can't, I don't, I don't, I lack that ability. But I am very good at sort of picking up on cues uh, that, that, that revolve around, you know, the classic Shakespearean um, uh, 
emotions of ambition and greed and love and uh, lust and you know, all the things that, that, that comprise a human drama. Um, that's my, that's what I do. Um, and I've been lucky that, you know, um, well, first of all, I've been lucky that Bethany has been my, my writing partner. Um, you know, we're in the middle of writing a second book together, but you know, the, so. You Wait, know, don't you have, don't you already have two books together? Smartest guys in the room about Enron and, uh, well, my the name other is, was, my name is yeah. not on the smart, smartest guys in the room. That was an interesting, what, what happened in that situation to jump ahead is that after um, Enron imploded, Bethany had written, you know, the story that began their implosion um, called, uh, is, uh, uh, called, the title, uh, talk about undersell, the title was, is Enron uh, overpriced or something like that. Um, and, and she basically said, nobody understands how they make money. It's a big black box. And nobody had ever and, said that before. Was, and and was she an, was, she was working uh, at Fortune for you. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I wasn't her direct editor, but I was above, I was the editor of her editors, of her editor. So, um, and I was in this meeting, I, I, this famous meeting where Andy Fastow, the, the crooked CFO, nobody knew that at the time, came to Fortune to uh, try to talk us out of doing the story. And uh, yeah. And this was like three days before publication. Um, and uh, I, uh, I was in that meeting and Bethany was just like relentless, you know, what about this, what about this, what about this, what about this? And they didn't have good answers to any, oh, we're a logistics company, we're this, we're that, the reason you don't understand is this, that, whatever. And we got done and we walked back into Bethany's office and he picked up his coat to put it on and he looked at her and he said, I don't really care what you say about Enron. You know, just 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 make me look good, okay? <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. So um, and you know, the great the great um regret of that story is that Bethany had seen the footnote that the Wall Street Journal found uh seven months later about how um an officer of the company was running these um, um, these side deals. She found that footnote and she thought, well, you know, this guy, this is in a, you know, this is in a government uh, document. And so it must be okay. Mm -hmm. And so she didn't. Um, these are these were the special purpose vehicles. Th yeah. Thank you for remembering that. Yeah, the, for the special purpose vehicles. That's right. So she didn't put that in her story. And her story began the stock from the time she wrote her story to the time the Wall Street Journal figured out about the special purpose entities. The stock had dropped from 80 to 30. And once the Wall Street Journal wrote that, the stock went from 30 to zero in about you know, a month. They, they filed for bankruptcy in uh, right around Christmas that year. Mm. Yeah. And then, so then I, I was adamant that, that, you know, Bethany had been on the lead on this and Fortune had really, um, and, and she wrote a great story once they went bankrupt, a really, really fabulous story once they went bankrupt. And I was just adamant that, that Fortune not, lose uh, ownership of the story that that's kind of what was i was thinking that's how i was thinking about it so i persuaded my bosses to let her and another great journalist peter elkind team up and write a book about it and that i would be their internal editor because they both had such different writing styles somebody had to make it sound like one person and that was my job uh so we got a really nice, we got like $1.4 million or something. And we split it four ways, Bethany, Peter, me, and Fortune Magazine. And we were off to the races. And then now, they made course, a, who, who got the movie rights to that? Alex Gibney. This was a big moment in his career too. Uh, you know, he's probably the country's best known documentarian at this point. But, you know, he had, you know, he, he bought the rights for 
not a whole lot of money and he did the smartest guys in the room and it, it was uh it was his it was it was nominated for an oscar Ooh, which we lost to those which we lost to the goddamn penguins <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now uh, you're at Fortune, and uh, right. how did your fortune change after that? Well, Fortune was a great experience. Um, fortune taught me a lot about rigor, because you know Carol Loomis and people like that who really understand numbers and care about precision, and um, it taught me how to write for a business audience as well as a non-business audience. It, I got to meet John Huey, who became kind of my second mentor in the sense that um, uh, he was, he was hard charging, he was charismatic, he was interesting, he was fun. Um, and he kind of taught me, I had always, I had always shied away from jumping into stories um, that a lot of other people were writing. It's like, you know, I, I, you know, I want to do stuff that's, that's where I'm on my own and I don't have to worry about anybody, you know, creeping up behind me and competing like that. And John really, uh, you know, taught me to, to, to not be afraid of, uh, uh, you know, competing with a, with a herd, with a crowd. And, um, you know, eventually one of the things I did uh, for Fortune that I was happiest with in retrospect is something called the Microsoft Diaries. Now, you know, we didn't really have the internet back then, or, you know, uh, uh, so I would go down to the Microsoft trial, which lasted, you know, 1999, 2000. Um, was that when it was? Yeah, right around then. I'm trying to remember when it was. But anyway, um, yeah, it was 20 years ago, 20 some years ago. And uh, I would write a, a dispatch every two weeks. Um, uh, kind of daily diary of the trial. And it was a big, big hit. And there were tons of other reporters there, but it was different from any, what anybody else was doing. And uh, and I, it was a lot of fun and I was very happy with it. It's also how I got to meet David Boyce, who would then go on to become a pretty important figure in my life, uh, namely because my wife went to work for him at one point and is now his, uh, has been for the last seven or eight years, even though she's not with the firm anymore, his, chief PR person. Did you uh, get to know Bill Gates? No, um, <laughs> I did not. I um, Have I ever actually met Bill Gates? Yes, I met him once uh, at the foundation many years later. No, I didn't get to know Bill Gates. Uh, he did do some kind of uh, 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 press conference at one point and I asked him a nasty question that made news. I can't remember what it was today, but uh, no, I didn't get to know Bill Gates. I got to know a lot of other people at, at, um, uh, at Microsoft, but not him. All right, now you're at Fortune and was that when you made the transition to the New York Times or? Uh... Yes, um, at, at a certain point, Fortune got a new editor basically what happened was um, I'd been at Fortune for 10 or 11 years and, and, and with a variety of roles, some editing, some writing. It was a really, uh, it was a good gig. And it, Fortune was a great magazine. And um, it was tough because after the internet bubble burst in 2001, um, I, was, I was by then uh, uh, in a leadership role and a lot of the job was laying people off, which was not fun. And um, uh, Norm Perlstein, who was running Time Inc. then, installed a new editor because he thought the current editor, my friend uh, uh, Rick Kirkland, I think, wasn't being tough enough, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so uh, uh, I thought to myself, I kind of need to get out of here. I, I've, you know, I've done what I'm going to do and it's not going to get any better and it's just going to get worse with the layoffs. And, um, so, yeah, so I was lucky in that Bill Keller was then running the New York Times and um, uh, he's an old friend of mine from, 
from the days when I was in Washington doing journalism. Uh, and uh, we had lunch and, and it turned out that he was looking, just as I was looking for uh, a new gig, he was looking for somebody to shore up the business section on Saturdays because the Wall Street Journal was about to start the Saturday edition of the journal. So he was, uh, it was in, he decided that I would be part of that solution and he hired me to write um, a business column on Saturdays. Uh, and so that's what I did from about 2005 to 2010 with, with a few magazine stories thrown in. Is that when you got interested in uh, the sports business, the uh, no, collegiate I got interested, sports? Yeah, I got interested in the sports business after I went to the op-ed page, which was around mm. 2011 or so, something like that, maybe 2010. I got interested in the sports. I got interested in the NCAA because um, the Times Magazine came to me and just said, said as a hypothetical, as a hypothetical exercise, if you were going to pay college players, how would you go about doing it? So I spent about three months on that story in between my columns. And um, I, that's when I, you know, you can be a college sports fan your whole life and not realize that the players are getting screwed, at least not back then. And that the reporting for that was a real eye opener for me. Cause that's when I first thought, Oh man, this is horrible. Um, um, hey, uh, do, um, I gotta, I gotta grab something in the refrigerator. Uh, I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> I suppose I could keep talking, but um... so the NCAA. Um... So, so yeah, so uh, the 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 Times Magazine gave me this assignment. That's when my eyes really opened up as to how badly the players are being exploited. Um, uh, and how everybody was getting rich off the backs of this basically a free labor force and how the NCA was fundamentally a cartel, a monopsony, I think they call it. And so um, I wrote the this, this, this story and then I wrote a column that was sort of more or less intended to promote the story. And the NCAA sent a nasty note about something in the story that they said was wrong. And I looked at it and, and it was like, you gotta be kidding, fellas. And I, that's when I was off to the races. And um, what happens when you discover that the NCAA, when you discover just how egregiously awful the NCAA is, what happens is you, you, you and I saw this happen to other people too, not just me. You just be, you start to boil with rage and you want to expose everything and all this stuff that people in the sports world have known around for years, you're suddenly horrified. You know, the, the girl from England who can't play for Harvard because the NCAA won't accept the British uh, test that all 15, 16 year olds have to take. You know, it's just, it, it, now that's not a big thing, but it, 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 you read it, it's like, can you really be this dense? Can you really be this uncaring? And the answer is yes, it turns out, yes. And so then you start to learn about their background. So that first year I probably wrote 15 columns about, um, about the NCAA. And the next year I probably wrote 10 columns. And I never, e even once the rage you know, subsided, um, I never stopped writing about it. Um, uh, um, just because I thought it was an important story. You know, in the beginning, I would occasionally get um, letters to the editor. and say, uh, dear Mr. Nocera, you know, why are you doing this? If I want to read about sports, I go to the sports page. You're an op-ed columnist, write about stuff that matters. And I would write back and I'd say, I do not view this as a sports story. I view this as a human rights story and a civil rights story because so many of these players are black. And by the way, when's the last time you saw a white kid get punished by the NCAA? Think about that for a second. So um, by the time 
I left the op-ed page, nobody wrote letters like that because what had happened was the combination of uh, Taylor Branch's story in the Atlantic, uh, my work at the Times, and Sally Jenkins maybe at the Washington Post, suddenly the East Coast, the coastal elites who had never cared about this issue suddenly kind of woke up uh, because it was being brought to their attention that there's something wrong here. And you saw this incredible change in the zeitgeist. Uh, it was a little bit like, um, I mean, the, what I compare it to is uh, marriage equality which you know, was, was a, a, a minority, a, an issue where the minority of the population favored it for years and years and years and years, and then suddenly, boom, the whole country was in favor of it. Right. And this was like that, this felt like that. When I started in 2010, it just felt like a really lonely voice. I felt very uh, uh, out on a limb, you know, um, Don Quixote-like. And by the time, I mean, today, I mean, my God, um, the NCAA, you know, I, I saw a, um, I, I, somebody leaked a document to me once that showed, that showed that um, the general counsel sort of saying, well, if worse comes to worse, we can always go to Congress and get them to pass an, uh, 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 an antitrust exemption. Hmm. And, you know, here we are today, they can't even get Congress to talk to them. Nobody in Congress trusts them. Um, so it's been quite a, uh, it's been, I, I've been, I'm proud of what I did there. I'm obviously not the only person who made how well this happened or a lot of people, but, um, but I do think that my work in this instance actually made a significant difference. Oh yeah, the visibility of the New York Times. I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, what about the great financial crisis, your book with uh, Bethany? Uh, with Bethany? Well, um, let me think about that for a second. How did that come about? How did that come about? Well, it came about, yeah. Um, you know, we, Bethany had a relationship with, uh, Bethany and I both had a relationship with the editor, uh, Adrian Zackheim at Portfolio, which is a division of Penguin. Uh, now Penguin Random House. And, you know, we were both, where was she working at the time? Was she at Vanity Fair then? I can't remember where she was. I think she was at Vanity Fair then. So she was writing occasional features, dealing with the crisis. I was um, writing columns about it. I actually wrote uh, several front page, I, I could have co-wrote several front page stories about it. I was knee deep in the middle of it. Um, and um, um, I, I think, you know, I just remember going over to her little um, New York apartment one day and we just sat down and banged out a, 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 um, an outline. And I don't remember the moment when we said, hey, let's do this, but, but, um, but I know we both were really interested in it and really wanted to do it. And so, and I also knew that I couldn't do it by myself. And she maybe thought the same thing uh, uh, just because of time constraints. And it turned out, banged out the outline and, and Adrian uh, liked it and, and gave us a contract and uh, we were off to the races. Um, we're very good collaborators. We both sort of know our roles and our strengths and our weaknesses. And, um, uh, you know, we fight a little bit, but not very much. And, and usually the fights are over kind of intellectual issues, not, you know, words on the page. So what are you writing about now with her? Uh, COVID and the, the effect of COVID on the economy uh, and uh, how, how the flaws of modern capitalism help make the economic consequences of COVID much worse than they otherwise would have been. You mean the lack of, uh, of uh, safety net? Is that? Well, you could start with that, but we were thinking more like, you know, globalization, 
uh, destroying the supply chains uh, for hospital, you know, it's, it's everywhere now, but it started. I mean, you couldn't get a, you could not get an N95 in April of 2020, could not get one. The black market, the black market took it over. Um, you know, the, the effect of private equity on nursing homes, you know, um, you know, just, just, you know, the, fi the, the financialization of the American economy is really what I'm talking about and how that has um, uh, the, 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 the damaging consequences of that were really highlighted by the pandemic. Hmm. Oh, so. Well, that's a worthwhile topic. That might, <laughs> that might be another interview. Yeah, that's true. Well, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, it's worthwhile, but also difficult. It's, it's not the easiest book we've ever written, I'll tell you that. How far off is the uh, finished product? I declined to comment on the, <laughs> on the grounds that it may incriminate me. <laughs> okay. But you, so have a pub you have a publisher. Anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. Same, same publisher, Adrian, you know, portfolio, same deal. Yeah, we've, I mean, really, I haven't published with anybody else in 20 years. So, so gonna, let's turn little... toward, toward uh, sort of your more general views um, about the media, changes in the media that you've seen over the years, uh, coverage of economic issues. Uh, capitalism. How do, you, how do you, well, capitalism, but... Uh, where 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 do you stand on the way things uh, have gone? There are uh, debates about uh, what who's canceled and about. Yeah, we understand that you're you're pro Trump, right? <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. Canceled. I, anyway, I just... um, where where you have any? Uh, well, sort of general you know, viewpoint there, or, or well, you know. yeah, I mean, I have a general viewpoint. I think it's ridiculous that people can't have dissenting views without being flamed, tossed out of universities. I think it's, I think it's ridiculous. I think, I think the coddling of the American student is, is, is absurd. I'm with Barry Weiss on this. I'm actually with Barry Weiss on more things than I, than you think. Um, I think the um, the efforts to silence contrarian scientists has been criminal. You know, a guy like Martin Kuldoff, for God's sakes, he's a Harvard epidemiologist, but because he believes that lockdowns are useless and um, that we should protect the elderly and let everybody else go about their lives, which I I think is a defensible position and not a, you know, anti-science position. Uh, you know, the, the 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 efforts to silence him. I think I think it's it's absurd, mm -hmm. and I think this goes back to, um, well, it probably goes back before this, but but I think I actually think it goes back to climate change because I mean I think a lot of the same thing happened with climate change. If you're a if you're a scientist who dissents from the conventional wisdom on climate change you're viewed as somehow a tool of Exxon, you know? Um, one of the things I like to say, um, and I think applies here, is that um, uh, how do I say it? Ideology is as powerful as money. You know, that people say, well, you're biased because you took money from such and such a group. Well, no, you're biased because, you know, you have this worldview that you cannot accept anybody who thinks differently. So, uh, yeah, that, 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 that bothers me. Yeah. What do you think? It, I assume you're familiar with Steven Pinker's stuff. Yeah. The fact not... that, okay. That then let's, that, it, it, yeah. He's my example of somebody who, I mean, he's liberal, he's scientific, and he, because he's believes that there's been progress, he's viewed as the enemy by a lot of people on the left. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, look, the dirty little secret is progressives are as ideologically rigid as anybody in the Tea Party. They just don't see themselves that way because they think they're 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 on the right side. Right. It's sad. It's sad. You know, I'm. You know. Ugh. Why do you think, though, um, it's sort of penetrated? Um, well, I mean, I think perhaps the New York Times itself, but mainstream media people who um, grew up in a period of uh, hoping for as much objectivity as possible. How do you think it emerged at those how, mainstream how, how institutions? At, at, the main, at, at a mainstream institution like... Uh, well, whatever you can choose. I mean, how they became how they became woke. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Politically correct. Well, um, I think that uh, I think institutions don't have the stature that they used to have, so employees aren't afraid of being fired or quitting. And I think that um, you know a whole generation of uh, young people coming out of college uh, with this idea that, you know, um, uh, if you say something offensive, it's, a, it's basically a fireable offense. I mean, I think it flows from what the way they were treated as college students. And then, um, and then I think uh, the um, young employees don't have the same fear and reverence of the institutions that they used to have. Ooh. And so they're much more willing to say, you know, you know, to rise up and say, you know, you can't do this, you can't say this, you can't write this. Ooh, interesting. So uh, are you, currently you're, doing books, anything else? Uh, you occasionally write for the Times, I still, I believe. Uh, yeah, well, let's talk podcasting. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right, right. The, the, the uh, shrink, uh, shrink next door. The shrink next door. That's right, baby. That's the and, only thing I'm known for right now. <laughs> and how did you get into that? I moved next door to a shrink. Ah, OK. Did you buy a house or rent the house next? Door? No, I bought a house. I'm sitting. I'm sitting in the house right now. Oh, and with my dog. My dog is. Uh, my dog has a hard time being in the city, in New York City. He's getting old, so I take him out here a lot, so he can be in the backyard. Um, but yeah, no, I bought this house, and uh, you know, next thing you know, this this uh, this guy comes over to my house and says, my says my boss, who's a, who's a big shot New York psychiatrist, would like to invite you to one of his parties. So I went to the party for about 20 minutes and then I had drinks with him and my wife and I bought the, it was kind of a weird experience. And, uh, uh, and then the following winter, following summer, excuse me, uh, the shrink wasn't there anymore. And the guy who had called him his boss came over with a woman to my house and he said I want you to meet my sister Phyllis I haven't seen her in 27 years and I said huh and then he started to explain that the shrink had been in control had basically taken over his life and had cut out and that he was the owner of the house next door not the shrink and that he had kicked him out last October after th after 27 years and reunited with his sister and that the shrink had taken over his life and uh, taken over the house and made himself president of this company and had co-signed a Swiss bank account and had started a foundation together in which the patient would put in the money and the shrink would mostly take it out. And just as a journalist, it's like, huh, I'm interested in that. And, um, and so I, I, you know, I did a story about it um, that was gonna run in the New York Times Magazine, but for whatever reason did not run. Um, and I put the manuscript in my bottom drawer for about five or six years. And then my son 
Nick, my grown son, Nick, uh, who's kind of in the streaming movie streaming business or TV streaming business called me and said, dad, you know, your story really should be a podcast. And just so happened by coincidence that um, uh, Bloomberg, where I worked then, was looking to partner with a company called Wondery, uh, which is a special which specializes in true crime pod, narrative podcasts. And they took a look at this manuscript and they said, "This is what we want to do." And that's how it happened. Wow! It was, so you never met the shrink. I did. I had a two-hour interview with him, and my tape recorder didn't work. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Speaking of which, have you have you, are you recording this, Bob? Did you turn of the course. record? Okay, oh, good. Jesus! If he's not recording this, I'm leaving. No, no, no! I meant after you went to the refrigerator. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I heard him. I heard him turn it back on. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That would and, be. And uh, yeah. so. Um, yeah, now it became a TV series. We yeah. haven't watched all of it. So, so the days. problem now is that Bloomberg doesn't want to give you your due? It's really complicated. It's, 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 it's more that I can't get Bloomberg to tell me the truth about what monies are due and what is not due. And uh, uh, uh. I can't... I can't give them to get them to give me a straight answer. So I feel like I've been put in this position where I have to sue to get an accounting. Um, also, you think they would want to sign me to, to an NDA just to shut me up, but apparently yeah. not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So anyway, it's a pain in the neck, but it, you know, it's not gonna last forever. And uh, hopefully so I won't get broke. I won't go broke doing this. Now, do you take any, you don't narrate it or anything, do you? You're just the writer? No, listen to the, yeah, listen to the I podcast. Haven't listened to, I haven't okay. listened to the podcast. Okay, the podcast is much darker than the TV show. Okay. And, and I'm a character in the podcast, and I'm also the narrator. Okay, all right. Yeah. Very good, very good. And I've signed up, I've signed up with another, a new podcast company based in London, um uh to do more podcasts i think i'm going to spend my my 70s which are right around the corner um writing writing books and doing podcasts oh that's great that's one so i look great. forward to it yeah so to you'll it. you'll be competing with planet money right no <laughs> <laughs> Or Freakonomics, Freakonomics no, radio. No, I, I do. I want to do podcasts that are like stories that are six, right, you know, right. five or six part. That's what I care about. That, that's what's fun for me. I don't want to do something where I'm on every day or every week or anything like that. Right. Well, that's, and with, <clears throat> we, we all look forward to that. And um, thank you. I want to uh, thank you <clears throat> so much for. Uh, giving us a lot of food for thought and uh, hearing about <clears throat> your adventures over the years. Um, and uh, I hope you someone, keep up. Yeah, keep it up. As someone Thank from you. a family of 10, I uh, sort of have a That's right, Bob. Bob Lerman trumps you. <laughs> where, but, where are you in the pecking order? I'm fourth. Uh, that's that's a good place to be. That's a good yeah, place. Yeah, it was a be. good place to be. The upper, uh, the upper, the upper tier. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and we, uh, we at some point we'll talk to you about our our business as a family as well. So yeah, they have a family uh, business. But um, anyway, in great. in fact, one of our interviewees is his brother Dave, who was the oldest. And was the CEO until recently. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, it's a very interesting story about strikes. But anyway, uh, thank you so much. And uh, this was a lot of fun, guys. Thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll keep in me. touch. All, All right. right. All right. Let's do it again. Late. Take care. Bye. Sayonara. Oh, wait. No. Wait. Zygazun. 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 <laughs> right.